I don't think that warm-up tests ahead of Rugby World Cups are worth reading into too much for most international teams. For England and Wales though, I think we've learned exactly how they are going to go in the 2023 Rugby World Cup. With Eddie Jones sacked by England and Wayne Pivak sacked by Wales, Steve Borthwick and Warren Gatland will respectively take these two nations to the 2023 edition of the World Cup, having been in charge for less than a year. Prior to their tenures beginning, I predicted that Borthwick's time with England would be tough, while Gatlin would be able to improve Wales a little bit. After a few pretty boring test matches in the warm-up stages ahead of the World Cup as well, I'm now going to be titling today's analysis video this. This is because I genuinely believe that Samoa are going to beat England to qualify for the World Cup quarterfinals for the first time since 1995. If this prediction does come true, this will go down as the greatest upset in sporting history. I'm a little bit more hopeful for Wales, but a massive loss to South Africa will definitely be keeping them on their guard very much, as they are quite close in the rankings to Georgia. Fiji are also now ranked higher than Wales. So guys, do we have enough footage to answer the question I've asked in today's video title? Well, my name's Max, I'm the host over here at the Black Jersey, and let's get into this so we can find out the answer. Having been so thoroughly traumatised by South Africa throughout his life due to being a squad member in 2007 and assistant coach in 2019, Steve Borthwick has essentially designed a game plan to beat the box at all costs. To achieve this game plan, he's put heavy emphasis on results in the gym and results at set piece, while Marcus Smith, George Ford and Owen Farrell have long established goal kicking reputation. I don't think that to compare Borthwick's ideas to the Springboks is far-fetched at all. His selection of a crash ball 12 also shows us the similarities. While all of England's points in the first half at the Principality Stadium in Cardiff came off the tee, Wales on the other hand, at least they're trying to score tries. The difference in mentality wasn't exactly the most visible in the first half, but it became absolutely apparent when Gareth Davis scored the opening try. We'll notice that the Welsh formation is once again pre-planned. The first phase of the sequence begins with a maul, which eventually collapses. As Davis takes the ball on 46-42, we can see that Adam Baird was the jumper and is still getting up, while Jack Morgan and Aaron Wainwright are stuck on the ground. We'll come back to those two latter players soon, because now we want to focus on the Welsh manipulation of the English backfield to explain why these two were able to create the try for Davis in the first place. A very common thing that I've noticed in the modern game is the loop around of two players at once, as you can currently see the example of Damien McKenzie and Amoni Narawa, both Chiefs teammates, doing so against Los Pumas from earlier this year. We get to see the Warren Gatlin's take on this idea while we animate the initial England's defensive lines with the black arrows. By making this move around, cost Stillow and Reese Zammett leave Marcus Smith and Alex Dombrand marking nobody. We'll spotlight the genuine move so that we can now show off what Gatlin is trying to use the players to achieve. We'll freeze the frame right before Costello begins his pass to the outside, having collected the ball during his loop. North has blocked Porter from having the right to tackle Costello. While Smith can still do so, he needs to keep shifting wide. Cockin' Sieg continues to have an active defensive role, but hasn't been able to drift out this way. The loop from Rhys Zammett as a second player has prevented Cockinasiga from committing to Mark Lee Halfpenny, who is now marked by Max Malins instead, which will now force Freddie Stewart, floating in the backfield, to rush up and tackle Dyer. Although Halfpenny ends up passing to Dyer instead, the ruck forms exactly where Wales need it to form. Therefore, when Davis looks to Costello to start the next attack pattern, Stewart is still in frame, wandering back to his defensive position. Despite Despite having a few forwards ready to carry though, Costello utilises the penalty advantage to cross kick and we now come back to Morgan and Wainwright who is a key decision maker for the team. But thankfully for England, George Martin remembers the first half and he's read it. Martin does indeed come along but Wainwright gets an arm free and offloads. Although Sega has shown incredible work rate to get back to his side of the pitch, he's now put in a 2 on 1 which I believe was the initial intention of this play. I'm suspecting that from this current position, Jack Morgan has been told to give the pass on 4703 so that George North can run it in via Cock and a Sega, being forced to choose between one of these two defensive lines. 
Morgan makes the finish a lot more entertaining than the script though and does some improvised stepping before Stewart emerges again. Having been stuck on the English right wing before, he's now had to arrive in a defensive position late and much like Cock and Asiga had to do before, Stewart has to pick between one of the two defensive lines. He's right in front of the try line and flat footed as both he and Cock and Asiga fail to stop Davis scoring. As we compare the two different two on ones I've highlighted, we see that by going off script, Morgan is guaranteed the score by creating one closer to the line rather than blindly following a pre planned script. While Wales are such a small country who, as Wayne Pivak proved, simply don't have the talent pool to produce a full 80 of expansive rugby with distributors in the forwards, like Ireland, Scotland, France, or the All Blacks, they now have the self belief to win on little moments for the first time since 2019. Dan Bigger these days seems an awful lot calmer and with six English players all packed into the space over here in the 57th minute, he's able to identify the highlighted space of grass with nobody marking it. All three of his outside men are back so this will create a solid opportunity to enter England's half. The execution is beautiful and Wales reach the 22. These phases of play lead to George North scoring a pretty soft try but why did he score this completely unopposed? Joe Cock and Asiga knows that the English forwards simply have too much bulk to play a mobile game in test rugby. Kyle Sinclair, having only been on the pitch for three minutes, is taking too much time to get up and get into the line and I hope it's not because of an injury. Cock and Asiga knows that Sinclair, like me, lacks the fitness to play test rugby, so on 57-26, he takes Sinclair place in the main line backing himself to compensate for his teammates injury or lack of lung capacity depending on which reason is making him so slow. Cock and Asiga helps Ludlam to stop a pick and go but by 57.38, 12 seconds later we can now see that Smith and Van Portfleet are desperately calling for reinforcements in the back line. Guy Porter who will spotlight is rushing arounds to help but Cock and Asiga by trying to compensate by either an injury to Singler or Singler's lack of mobility is now stuck in his previous ruck, therefore unable to get to his own position on the wing. With Van Portfleet marking bigger and Porter having to choose between marking North and marking Halfpenny, it's a pretty easy try for Wales and almost certainly an incidence that contributed to Joe Cock and Asiga getting dropped. Anyway guys, there are far too many red and yellow cards from the Twickenham test for me to go over, so let's just keep straight on the point of trying to answer the question of art in the video title. There aren't many signs at all from the second test, but I do believe there are a couple couple symptoms of life that show that not all hope is necessarily lost for Wales. Despite fielding a B team, they still produced a couple of nice counter attacking at Twickenham, though it took until 65 minutes for a proper try scoring chance, while England are down to 12 players. As we can see, a three man pod of Beard and Lydiot are directly to the outside of this breakdown, while they also have a two man pod of Rafael and Matthias incredibly close as clean at options. Because of these two pods that are incredibly tight knit, Dan Cole, Jamie George and Maru Itoje need to mark the crap out of them at all costs, knowing the damage they can do with a gap between the breakdown and Cole. The three man advantage though, it allows for Dan Bigger to hang out as a fifth wheel on the blind side of the pitch, so that he can select between two carriers placed between their opposition. As we spotlight them here, Josh Adams and Thomas Williams can both realistically take this pass, but with Tommy Rafael also running an inside line available to clean a ruck, Williams is the safer option. Roberts is a calm player who recognises Rafael's availability straight away so gives the pass up for Williams who runs a line that forces Ford to turn. Williams scores the opening try at long last showing us that while the Welsh B team aren't anywhere near the standards of the Welsh A team they are still capable enough to perform the basics in open space. As for England's though I'm a little more alarmed. Conceding three yellow cards and one red, their only response to Wales was a pretty faceless response of a basic try off the mall to Maru Atoje, followed by the winning kick of the match to George Ford. After the alarm bells were turned on for England's post Wales, they started to get rather deafening against Ireland, having conceded 66% of their entire card range of either colour tally. Billy Vernapola also did this. 
As said before, there were simply too many cards at the Twickenham game for me to go over, but this here is very clearly a red card. Vernapola and Porter both have their waists tilted forward and have gone down low so there's no mitigating factor, while Vernapola can't even wrap either of his arms, with his right shoulder going straight into Porter's head. Not only does this tell us that Kevin Sinfield needs to be sacked straight away, right now, but it also tells us that Vernapola shouldn't have been picked for the World Cup in the first place. Further evidence of this, in the 8th minute, Ireland used two backs to clean this ruck around James Lowe, leaving Ross Byrne with the ability to select from a three-man pod that can go straight out the back to Bundyaki. As Josh van der Fleer takes the pass himself, we also see the option for Aki to enable another three-man pod on the open side, while Byrne is the last of the Irish players in frame, sitting in a single-man pod. Anyway... As for Vernapola, now that we've rewinded, we can see that the English Packers easily read the fact that Van der Fleer will be the carrier on 801. Will Stewart has identified that Aki is hiding him behind and has screamed it out. Vernapola therefore needs to be aggressive and shoot forward at Furlong so that a ToJ can properly commit to Van der Fleer. As Van der Fleer's hands go up though, Vernapola just takes his foot off the gas and passively just starts shifting his chest towards the open side because Omahini now has has a chance to bind to van der Fleer and shove him forward. Genja's forced to make up for Vernapola's laziness and needs to help its Hoje in a double tackle after its Hoje is left with a single shoulder to tackle with, having been forced to mark two players by Vernapola. But with Genj helping its Hoje, it's a lose-lose scenario for England, and this hole between the tackle and Will Stewart is now left completely open. A pretty easy 2-1-1 now leaves Aki completely unopposed as he dots the ball down for his 11th test try. You know how I talked about South Africa traumatizing Borthwick a little bit too much there, right guys? Well, not only has he copied their set piece, but he's copied their defensive system. I'll skip over how Ireland end up in this position since our focus of the video is England, but Ireland, much like Scotland, are trialing a move specifically designed to take out South Africa. Except Ross Byrne isn't trying to get this two-man pot of Byrne and Van der Fleer to pass. He's trying to send the ball to Mac Hansen who can cross-kick from the the 12 channel. When Hansen positions for the kicking stance, the pod are a blocking mechanism in front of him so that David Ribbons is far in front, while Aki on the outside as a crash ball option forces Ford to keep an eye on him. As we cut to the wide shot, England's defence takes the exact same stance as South Africa. Ford has shot straight up at Aki, Tuolangi has done it to Prendergast, while Daly, who is an atrocious defender, is literally marking nobody because Keenan hasn't wrapped around to the channel to receive a pass from Aki. By copying a defensive structure that South Africa first used literally four years ago, most teams now know how to deconstruct this press defense inside and out. While most fans will have a go at Freddie Stewart for missing this tackle, Ring Rose never should have been completely unmarked to begin with. The fact that Ireland used a center to do this means England fails to reach the play, while they've also now shown their hand about how their defense is going to be structured. What's absolutely insane is that the same thing happens again. England leave a giant overlap for James Lowe as well in the 56th minute, allowing him to get a pretty easy try. Oli Chesham had just come back from injury, so I'm not going to give him too much stick over this. I'll simply point it out that it'll be good for him to do this now, rather than at the Rugby World Cup. Jamie George, as I've discussed before on defence, is the English version of Franz Malherber. He plays as an on-fields defence coach, as I saw in the Six Nations, so he gets behind this breakdown to try and organise the team. By getting into this position, George is allowing for Alice Genge to slot into the space over here and mark the fringes of the ruck, stopping a pick and go for Gibson Park, also marking Mac Hansen. Chesham, though, moves into the space as well. Both of them are now marking Hansen and Gibson Park, leaving Sinclair to mark McCarthy while he's supposed to be marking Furlong. This is how the overlap is created, and we can now see a very clear advantage for Ireland out wide. Even my 72-year-old grandmother could have scored against England from this position. Know what's even more insane though guys? England do it two more times! I don't need to analyse these two efforts very much, pretty much just copy and paste every comment I made on how low scored and apply those comments to both Earls and Hansen's tries. England's response? literally nothing. Sinclair makes this pick and go from about 2 metres, scoring a try that basically any team could score under any circumstances. As for Wales guys, 
I do have a little bit more hope for them. While South Africa score a very interesting try, I'm intending to examine it in more extensive detail for another video next week, Wales do leave a couple of defensive holes to be exploited. The key reason I can see Wales continue to improve though is their awareness of these holes and their attempts to close them. As Visa looks to carry with Klain on his outside, we can clearly see that this Welsh pod needs to move further to the right of our screen to let Morgan and Aserati in to tackle Visa who charges into the tackle of Lydiot. Ben Carter though, as Wales continue working to defend, is clearly aware that the team needs more numbers on the open side as he makes the gesture for his team to move. Johnny Williams needs to be in the space here, but he's currently between LaRue and Marnie LeBoc, which gives Damien Dialendi the chance to wrap around into this channel, forcing Dyer to pick between himself and Jesse Creel. Williams' fails defensive positioning opens the hole for LaRue himself before he dummies and goes wide to Kane and Moody who scores, but at least Wales at least seemed self-aware of what they did wrong here. The penalty try by Rio Dyer to deny South Africa the score, as well as this moment of pure panic from Mason Grady that enables Creel's first try to be scored, these aren't moments that need to be overanalyzed. Wales are a young team just showing symptoms of their lack of inexperience. If they want to get out of their current rut, going through moments like these are just simply going to need to be accepted by the fan base. Wales though, at least they're showing they can attack in periods of play, unlike England who seemingly cannot do it at all. Kieran Hardy spots Hendrickson and Moody rushing out of line in the same formation England used with a press defence as Sneiman and Cock close the space slower. Wales have five players on the blind side for Hendrickson to focus on, so Hardy gives the ball to Grady. By giving the ball to Grady, Hardy hasn't just forced his opposite to tackle the biggest back in the Welsh team, but he's also given Grady the chance to pass behind himself to Costello, who can put Moody into a two on one and create a try in the 51st minute. Jack Morgan also wraps around. Moody shows absolutely unbelievable pace to stop what would have been a certain try for Wales, hence why I am feeling just a little bit more optimistic for them. The intercept given away by Kieran Hardy though is absolutely what got him dropped from the World Cup squad. Kai Evans, who was also dropped for this incident, is an inexperienced player, a little bit excited to take the ball, but instead of showing some seniority and resisting the temptation, Hardy skips the pod of Lydia and Wainwright who are already marked, giving Peter Steph Dutoy the chance for an intercept as he noticed Evans screaming for the ball as we can see over here. With Tom Rogers missing the tackle on Jesse Creel, the try scorer, don't expect to see Wales making huge errors like this now that the three Welsh players we've mentioned here have been dropped dropped from the World Cup squad. This pass from Johnny Williams as well simply shouldn't have happened, hence why Williams is unlikely to start in the key games of the tournament. Bigger from this position on 60-14 needs to take the ball into contact. Reese Zammett on his left isn't a realistic option because he doesn't have any ruck clearances available while Williams and Rogers are in the position to clean Bigger. Moody has also read the pass Bigger looks to make to Williams because Wales have Evans waiting on the wing looking to run down the blind side. Moody has now got into Williams' face giving him no other choice but to flick the ball back to Rogers as he has no ruck clearances available. Moody is well aware of this, intercepting and managing to score. Wales, unlike England though, were at least able to have the final say in their last test match before the World Cup, while showing a clear cut ability to build pressure in the lead up to Sam at Parry's try. So, are England and Wales facing pull stage exits? Well guys, for Wales, all of the errors that we've gone through, most of them are pretty fixable. As I've mentioned as well, a lot of the key players involved in making these problems happen for Wales have been dropped. For example, Kieran Hardy against South Africa didn't do too well at all. Wales, they've got a pretty easy pull as well. Their pool is definitely the easiest of the Rugby World Cup. They may be close in rankings to Fiji, Australia and Georgia, but ultimately they've got a coach who knows what he's doing, a coach that's very experienced. And so if Wales do well, they could be semi-finalists considering their side of the draw, but if they do badly, well, pool stage exit is happening for sure. England, on the other hand, have got absolutely no life in attack. The, it's, the attack's pretty much been called every insult under the book. It's been called flat, blunt, just bad in general. It's not going very well at all. And the RFU right now are getting their karma for sacking Eddie Jones, which was a terrible decision. 
England's tackle technique is also going to get them caught out many a time, especially against Argentina, who have a huge emphasis on the three-point game, kicking for territory and punishing the opposition for giving away their penalties. England's don't really have the fire that's going to annoy Argentina either, hence why they don't have a chance in topping their pool. Samoa, considering they've improved a lot regarding the driving wall and their set piece, will absolutely be licking their lips. It's a shame that Samoa haven't officially announced their last player in the 33-man squad because I would have liked to have done an analysis video on them, but for my next analysis video, I'll either have a preview of the All Blacks or the Springboks up next. So thank you very much for watching this video, guys. England are not going to do well, Wales, there's still a slight chance of hope, but that's all I'll say for today's video. Make sure to support me over on Instagram the threads, and like and subscribe and comment your thoughts down below if you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much guys, and a big thank you as well to my patrons most of all. You guys are absolutely amazing, I really appreciate your support, and so there we go, that's the end of the video. Cheers to my patrons, cheers to you guys for watching, I'm going to see you later, cheers from Max.